The Brothers Karamazov Novel by Fyodor Dostoevsky Narrated by Andrew Originally published in 1880 This is a great audiobook production created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 5 So be it, so be it. The elder's absence from his cell had lasted for about 25 minutes. It was more than half past 12, but Dmitri, on whose account they had all met there, had still not appeared. But he seemed almost to be forgotten, and when the elder entered the cell again, he found his guests engaged in eager conversation. Ivan and the two monks took the leading share in it. Myasov, too, was trying to take a part, and apparently very eagerly, in the conversation. But he was unsuccessful in this also. He was evidently in the background, and his remarks were treated with neglect, which increased his irritability. He had had intellectual encounters with Ivan before, and he could not endure a certain carelessness Ivan showed him. Hitherto at least I have stood in the front ranks of all that is progressive in Europe, and here the new generation positively ignores us, he thought. Fyodor Pavlovich, who had given his word to sit still and be quiet, had actually been quiet for some time, but he watched his neighbor Myasov with an ironical little smile. Obviously enjoying his discomfiture. He had been waiting for some time to pay off old scores, and now he could not let the opportunity slip. Bending over his shoulder, he began teasing him again in a whisper. Why didn't you go away just now, after the courteously kissing? Why did you consent to remain in such unseemly company? It was because you felt insulted and aggrieved, and you remained to vindicate yourself by showing off your intelligence. Now you won't go till you've displayed your intellect to them. You again. On the contrary, I'm just going. You'll be the last, the last of all to go. Fyodor Pavlovich delivered him another thrust, almost at the moment of Father Zosima's return. The discussion died down for a moment, but the elder, seating himself in his former place, looked at them all as though cordially inviting them to go on. Alyosha, who knew every expression of his face, saw that he was fearfully exhausted and making a great effort. Of late he had been liable to fainting fits from exhaustion. His face had the pallor that was common before such attacks, and his lips were white. But he evidently did not want to break up the party. He seemed to have some special object of his own in keeping them. What object? Alyosha watched him intently. We are discussing this gentleman's most interesting article, said Father Iasif, the librarian, addressing the elder and indicating Ivan. He brings forward much that is new, but I think the argument cuts both ways. It is an article written in answer to a book by an ecclesiastical authority on the question of the ecclesiastical court and the scope of its jurisdiction. I'm sorry I have not read your article, but I've heard of it, said the elder, looking keenly and intently at Ivan. He takes up a most interesting position, continued the father librarian. As far as church jurisdiction is concerned, he is apparently quite opposed to the separation of church from state. That's interesting. But in what sense? Father Zosima asked Ivan. The latter, at last, answered him, not condescendingly, as Alyosha had feared, but with modesty and reserve, with evident goodwill and apparently without the slightest arriere pensee. I start from the position that this confusion of elements, that is, of the essential principles of church and state, will, of course, go on forever. In spite of the fact that it is impossible for them to mingle, and that the confusion of these elements cannot lead to any consistent or even normal results. For there is falsity at the very foundation of it. Compromise between the church and state in such questions as, for instance, jurisdiction, is, to my thinking, impossible in any real sense. My clerical opponent maintains that the church holds a precise and defined position in the state. I maintain, on the contrary, that the church ought to include the whole state, and not simply to occupy a corner in it, and, if this is, for some reason, impossible at present, then it ought, in reality, to be set up as the direct and chief aim of the future development of Christian society. Perfectly true, Father Pacey, the silent and learned monk, assented with fervor and decision. The purest ultramontanism cried Myasov impatiently, crossing and recrossing his legs. Oh, well, we have no mountains, cried Father Iasif, and turning to the elder he continued. Observe the answer he makes to the following fundamental and essential propositions of his opponent, who is, you must note, an ecclesiastic. 
First, that no social organization can or ought to arrogate to itself power to dispose of the civic and political rights of its members. Secondly, that criminal and civil jurisdiction ought not to belong to the church and is inconsistent with its nature, both as a divine institution and as an organization of men for religious objects. And finally, in the third place, the church is a kingdom not of this world. A most unworthy play upon words for an ecclesiastic. Father Pacey could not refrain from breaking in again. I have read the book which you have answered, he added, addressing Ivan, and was astounded at the words, the church is a kingdom not of this world. If it is not of this world, then it cannot exist on earth at all. In the gospel, the words not of this world are not used in that sense. To play with such words is indefensible. Our Lord Jesus Christ came to set up the church upon earth. The kingdom of heaven, of course, is not of this world, but in heaven, but it is only entered through the church which has been founded and established upon earth. And so a frivolous play upon words in such a connection is unpardonable and improper. The church is, in truth, a kingdom and ordained to rule, and in the end must undoubtedly become the kingdom ruling over all the earth. For that we have the divine promise. He ceased speaking suddenly, as though checking himself. After listening attentively and respectfully, Ivan went on, addressing the elder with perfect composure and as before with ready cordiality. The whole point of my article lies in the fact that during the first three centuries Christianity only existed on earth in the church and was nothing but the church. When the pagan Roman Empire desired to become Christian, it inevitably happened that, by becoming Christian, it included the church but remained a pagan state in very many of its departments. In reality, this was bound to happen. But Rome as a state retained too much of the pagan civilization and culture, as, for example, in the very objects and fundamental principles of the state. The Christian church entering into the state could, of course, surrender no part of its fundamental principles, the rock on which it stands, and could pursue no other aims than those which have been ordained and revealed by God himself. And among them that of drawing the whole world and therefore the ancient pagan state itself, into the church. In that way, that is, with a view to the future, it is not the church that should seek a definite position in the state, like every social organization. Or as an organization of men for religious purposes, as my opponent calls the church, but, on the contrary, every earthly state should be, in the end, completely transformed into the church and should become nothing else but a church rejecting every purpose incongruous with the aims of the church. All this will not degrade it in any way or take from its honor and glory as a great state, nor from the glory of its rulers, but only turns it from a false, still pagan, and mistaken path to the true and rightful path, which alone leads to the eternal goal. This is why the author of the book on the foundations of church jurisdiction would have judged correctly if, in seeking and laying down those foundations, he had looked upon them as a temporary compromise inevitable in our sinful and imperfect days. But as soon as the author ventures to declare that the foundations which he predicates now, part of which Father Iasif just enumerated, are the permanent, essential, and eternal foundations, he is going directly against the church and its sacred and eternal vocation. That is the gist of my article. That is, in brief, Father Pacey began again, laying stress on each word according to certain theories only too clearly formulated in the 19th century. The church ought to be transformed into the state, as though this would be an advance from a lower to a higher form, so as to disappear into it, making way for science, for the spirit of the age, and civilization. And if the church resists and is unwilling, some corner will be set apart for her in the state, and even then under control, and this will be so everywhere in all modern European countries. But Russian hopes and conceptions demand not that the church should pass as from a lower into a higher type into the state, but, on the contrary, that the state should end by being worthy to become only the church and nothing else. So be it. So be it. Well, I confess you've reassured me somewhat, Myasov said smiling, again crossing his legs. So far as I understand, then, the realization of such an ideal is infinitely remote, at the second coming of Christ. That's as you please. It's a beautiful utopian dream of the abolition of war, diplomacy, banks, and so on, something after the fashion of socialism, indeed. But I imagine that it was all meant seriously, 
and that the church might be now going to try criminals and sentence them to beating, prison, and even death. But if there were none but the ecclesiastical court, the church would not even now sentence a criminal to prison or to death. Crime and the way of regarding it would inevitably change, not all at once of course, but fairly soon. Ivan replied calmly, without flinching. Are you serious? Myasov glanced keenly at him. If everything became the church, the church would exclude all the criminal and disobedient and would not cut off their heads, Ivan went on. I ask you, what would become of the excluded? He would be cut off then not only from men, as now, but from Christ. By his crime he would have transgressed not only against men but against the church of Christ. This is so even now, of course, strictly speaking, but it is not clearly enunciated, and very, very often the criminal of today compromises with his conscience. I steal, he says, but I don't go against the church. I'm not an enemy of Christ. That's what the criminal of today is continually saying to himself, but when the church takes the place of the state it will be difficult for him. In opposition to the church all over the world, to say, all men are mistaken, all in error, all mankind are the false church. I, a thief and murderer, am the only true Christian church. It will be very difficult to say this to himself. It requires a rare combination of unusual circumstances. Now, on the other side, take the church's own view of crime. Is it not bound to renounce the present almost pagan attitude and to change from a mechanical cutting off of its tainted member for the preservation of society, as at present? into completely and honestly adopting the idea of the regeneration of the man, of his reformation and salvation. What do you mean? I fail to understand again, Myasov interrupted. Some sort of dream again. Something shapeless and even incomprehensible. What is excommunication? What sort of exclusion? I suspect you are simply amusing yourself, Ivan Fyodorovich. Yes, but you know, in reality it is so now, said the elder suddenly, and all turned to him at once. If it were not for the Church of Christ, there would be nothing to restrain the criminal from evil doing, no real chastisement for it afterwards. None, that is, but the mechanical punishment spoken of just now, which in the majority of cases only embitters the heart. And not the real punishment, the only effectual one, the only deterrent and softening one, which lies in the recognition of sin by conscience. How is that, may one inquire? asked Myasov, with lively curiosity. Why? began the elder, all these sentences to exile with hard labor, and formerly with flogging also, reform no one, and what's more, deter hardly a single criminal. And the number of crimes does not diminish but is continually on the increase. You must admit that. Consequently the security of society is not preserved, for, although the obnoxious member is mechanically cut off and sent far away out of sight, another criminal always comes to take his place at once and often two of them. If anything does preserve society, even in our time, and does regenerate and transform the criminal, it is only the law of Christ speaking in his conscience. It is only by recognizing his wrongdoing as a son of a Christian society, that is, of the church, that he recognizes his sin against society, that is, against the church. So that it is only against the church, and not against the state, that the criminal of today can recognize that he has sinned. If society, as a church, had jurisdiction, then it would know when to bring back from exclusion and to reunite to itself. Now the church having no real jurisdiction, but only the power of moral condemnation, withdraws of her own accord from punishing the criminal actively. She does not excommunicate him, but simply persists in motherly exhortation of him. What is more, the church even tries to preserve all Christian communion with the criminal. She admits him to church services, to the holy sacrament, gives him alms, and treats him more as a captive than as a convict. And what would become of the criminal, O Lord, if even the Christian society, that is, the church, were to reject him even as the civil law rejects him and cuts him off? What would become of him if the church punished him with her excommunication as the direct consequence of the secular law? There could be no more terrible despair, at least for a Russian criminal, for Russian criminals still have faith. Though, who knows, perhaps then a fearful thing would happen, Perhaps the despairing heart of the criminal would lose its faith, and then what would become of him? But the church, like a tender, loving mother, holds aloof from active punishment herself, as the sinner is too severely punished already by the civil law. And there must be at least someone to have pity on him. The church holds aloof, above all, 
because its judgment is the only one that contains the truth, and therefore cannot practically and morally be united to any other judgment even as a temporary compromise. She can enter into no compact about that. The foreign criminal, they say, rarely repents, for the very doctrines of today confirm him in the idea that his crime is not a crime, but only a reaction against an unjustly oppressive force. Society cuts him off completely by a force that triumphs over him mechanically and, so at least they say of themselves in Europe, accompanies this exclusion with hatred, forgetfulness, and the most profound indifference as to the ultimate fate of the erring brother. In this way, it all takes place without the compassionate intervention of the church, for in many cases there are no churches there at all. For though ecclesiastics and splendid church buildings remain, the churches themselves have long ago striven to pass from church into state and to disappear in it completely. So it seems at least in Lutheran countries. As for Rome, it was proclaimed a state instead of a church a thousand years ago. And so the criminal is no longer conscious of being a member of the church and sinks into despair. If he returns to society, often it is with such hatred that society itself instinctively cuts him off. You can judge for yourself how it must end. In many cases it would seem to be the same with us, but the difference is that besides the established law courts we have the church too, which always keeps up relations with the criminal as a dear and still precious son. And besides that, there is still preserved, though only in thought, the judgment of the church, which though no longer existing in practice is still living as a dream for the future, and is, no doubt, instinctively recognized by the criminal in his soul. What was said here just now is true too, that is, that if the jurisdiction of the church were introduced in practice in its full force, that is, if the whole of the society were changed into the church, not only the judgment of the church would have influence on the reformation of the criminal such as it never has now, but possibly also the crimes themselves would be incredibly diminished. And there can be no doubt that the church would look upon the criminal and the crime of the future in many cases quite differently and would succeed in restoring the excluded in restraining those who plan evil, and in regenerating the fallen. It is true, said Father Zosima, with a smile, the Christian society now is not ready and is only resting on some seven righteous men, but as they are never lacking. It will continue still unshaken in expectation of its complete transformation from a society almost heathen in character into a single universal and all-powerful church. So be it, so be it, even though at the end of the ages, for it is ordained to come to pass. And there is no need to be troubled about times and seasons, for the secret of the times and seasons is in the wisdom of God, in His foresight, and His love. And what in human reckoning seems still afar off, may by the divine ordinance be close at hand, on the eve of its appearance. And so be it, so be it, so be it, so be it, Father Pacey repeated austerely and reverently. Strange, extremely strange. Myasov pronounced, not so much with heat as with latent indignation. What strikes you as so strange? Father Iasif inquired cautiously. Why, it's beyond anything, cried Myasov, suddenly breaking out. The state is eliminated and the church is raised to the position of the state. It's not simply ultramontanism, it's arch-ultramontanism. It's beyond the dreams of Pope Gregory VII. You are completely misunderstanding it, said Father Pacey sternly. Understand, the church is not to be transformed into the state. That is Rome in its dream. That is the third temptation of the devil. On the contrary, the state is transformed into the church, will ascend and become a church over the whole world, which is the complete opposite of ultramontanism in Rome and your interpretation. And is only the glorious destiny ordained for the Orthodox Church. This star will arise in the East. Myasov was significantly silent. His whole figure expressed extraordinary personal dignity. A supercilious and condescending smile played on his lips. Alyosha watched it all with a throbbing heart. The whole conversation stirred him profoundly. He glanced casually at Rakuten, who was standing immovable in his place by the door listening and watching intently though with downcast eyes. But from the color in his cheeks Alyosha guessed that Rakuten was probably no less excited, and he knew what caused his excitement. Allow me to tell you one little anecdote, gentlemen. Myasov said impressively, with a peculiarly majestic air. Some years ago, soon after the coup d'état of December, I happened to be calling in Paris on an extremely influential personage in the government, and I met a very interesting man in his house. 
This individual was not precisely a detective but was a sort of superintendent of a whole regiment of political detectives, a rather powerful position in its own way. I was prompted by curiosity to seize the opportunity of conversation with him. And as he had not come as a visitor but as a subordinate official bringing a special report, and as he saw the reception given me by his chief, he deigned to speak with some openness. To a certain extent only, of course. He was rather courteous than open, as Frenchmen know how to be courteous, especially to a foreigner. But I thoroughly understood him. The subject was the socialist revolutionaries who were at that time persecuted. I will quote only one most curious remark dropped by this person. We are not particularly afraid, said he, of all these socialists, anarchists, infidels, and revolutionists, we keep watch on them and know all their goings on. But there are a few peculiar men among them who believe in God and are Christians, but at the same time are socialists. These are the people we are most afraid of. They are dreadful people. The socialist who is a Christian is more to be dreaded than a socialist who is an atheist. The words struck me at the time, and now they have suddenly come back to me here, gentlemen. You apply them to us and look upon us as socialists? Father Pacey asked directly, without beating about the bush. But before Pyotr Alexandrovich could think what to answer, the door opened, and the guest so long expected, Dmitri Fyodorovich, came in. They had, in fact, given up expecting him, and his sudden appearance caused some surprise for a moment. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.